Do you hear that? That's the sweet, sweet sound of the beginning of the Poor Pearls Almanac. As always, I'm your host, Andy, with my co-host, Elliot. It's winter, and we're cold and miserable and drinking heavily to pass the time. Or are we? I don't know. Nah, we're drinking, and it is cold as fuck. Uh, Single digits, so I'm definitely hitting the whiskey. Yeah, so to pass the time, we're going to go on a trip. A trip to the warm Iberian coast. Common misconception, going somewhere warm is a reprieve from the winter time. Also, I didn't pack. Where we're going, you don't need to pack clothes. I'm not sure how I feel about nude beaches. I get that, but I meant imagination. We're going to be talking about the Spanish Tejesas, a 3,000-year-old agricultural system that's still in practice today. It's traditionally seen as a method to maintain like pasture and grasslands and extremely dry climates. You got my hopes up. I thought we were taking a well-earned vacation. Hey, everyone. If you want to put Elliot on a plane in a pandemic, go support us on Patreon, because I can't afford it. Hashtag send Elliot to Spain. Hashtag send Elliot to Spain. Rolls right off the tongue. Yeah, and it's spelled just like it sounds. All right, so what are we doing in Spain? Uh, We've got Iberico piggy banks on the menu, right? So we do have piggy banks. In fact, a very special piggy bank. A corny piggy bank. Get it? A corn? Come on. Come on. No, I get it. You read and memorize jokes from popsicle sticks, and it makes me sad. Well, let's turn that frown upside down. Let's talk Spanish farming. Yay! (laughs) So what is a dehesa? It's basically a, a civil pasture system that's developed in places with really poor land, let's just call it that, and it's aimed at primarily livestock raising. Specifically, historically speaking, pigs and sheep. What's unique about this particular system is really how the concept of civil pasture is imagined. It's really geared towards increasing like the crown cover per tree and at really just producing acorns as well as the tree fodder and the grass below it. All right, so are pollard greens coming back this episode? Yeah, a little bit. We're not going to talk too much about them, but they are a part of the system. But primarily, we're going to be talking about the grass itself the trees themselves, and, um, you know, we'll, we'll touch on cork and fuel wood a little bit, but we don't have time to cover those as well. So there's two major goals of land cultivation in this system, both supplying fodder and grain for livestock, as well as water management. And it's really that second one that's of primary importance. The typical dehesa is located in like the southwestern part of the Iberian Peninsula, which is Spain and Portugal, and it covers about 8 to 10 million acres. So what's interesting in particular here is that compared to other places, we're seeing them try to actually resist the natural cycle in the sense of there's a very dense shrub pressure that exists there. And part of their land management practice is actually to push against that and keep it as grasslands. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Are these indigenous people or do we have to go back 8,000 or 2 million years with the classic yes and no answer? Like, are these acorns, you know, stuck in that glacier waiting for the King Arthur squirrel to get that nut? You know, I'm a dad. I only got so many jokes. It's what I come wired with. So let's dive in. Technically, when we uh, look at these dehesas, there's actually two different types. One that's focused on food production and one that's focused on cork production. We're going to focus primarily on the food production because that's what we're interested in. And also because there really isn't a whole lot of historical data on the cork production. Now, these unique systems are really a response to the ecological conditions of the coastal Mediterranean climate. You've got dry summers and moderately cold winters with pretty low soil fertility. Having this low soil fertility really means that traditional tilling isn't as productive because the process of tilling is basically pulling stuff from below the soil to temporarily feed the topsoil, but there's nothing good in it. This is also, in a way, what helped protect these systems from, like, the bludgeoning impact of capitalism for so long. All right, so they haven't been able to fit a Walmart in there yet, but I bet we could, right? You laugh, but, like, suburbanization is actually becoming a huge problem in these landscapes, primarily over the last, like, 50 years or so. Because of course it is. I mean, these pigs need cul-de-sacs of acorns to stay happy. Oh my god, I think you're rubbing off on me. I kind of hate it. Yeah, so let's step back to the past. (laughs) Five million years ago when- You're not serious, are you? 
No, I'm just fucking with you. So the the right, day because the Pliocene is <laughs> the Pliocene epic is just so boring. You know, you say that, but you know, we could do a whole episode on it. Do you want to? Next time, throw it in the hat. I'm not sure what to do with prepping, but you know, it'd be it'd be something, it'd be interesting. Let's throw it in the hat. Why not? We're always looking for topics. Yeah. So the Dehesa is an ancient system, not Pliocene ancient, but it's pretty old. The first written reference is from around 924, which based on the, the episodes we've done in the past, it's fairly new. But there is evidence that it's existed for like 6,000 years, starting when the Mediterranean forest was cleared to have grasslands. And in this process, they conserved and selected the oak trees with the biggest and uh, sweetest acorns. The evolution and expansion of this Dehesa system is really closely linked with a lot of historical events. That starts with like the conquest of the Iberian Peninsula from the Moors and the redistribution of that land. It's repopulation and separation from other various folks that came in and conquered it. And ultimately, later on in the 12th century on, the role of the Mesta, which we'll talk about a little bit, as well as the sale of church and nobility lands later on. Okay, good. Good public history, like public school history lesson there that skips over all the blood and the screams of the downtrodden. Don't worry, we got plenty of screams coming. And I mean, if you want blood, I've got some in the backyard. Don't ask about it. It's fine. That's real dark, just like I like it. It's fine. It's like chicken, most mostly chicken blood. Yeah, they get real excited when other chickens are bleeding. That's real weird. You got some creepy chickens. Listen, iron is iron. Can't fight it. So anyways, I think we're going to bypass all of that history stuff. Not really, but we're going to bypass a lot of it and talk a little bit of farming, which is everyone's favorite history. Yeah, I promise I won't bring up anything about the Moors. The more you know. I got nothing. It was a joke. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I'm, I'm a terrible person who can't not do it. I can't, I can't be stopped, and I know I have a problem. All right, so I guess we should... Uh, get this party started. Yeah. So can we just talk about Spain or let's do that? So pollen studies suggest that the early forms of management involved livestock grazing and human managed fire. I know. I feel like we've heard this story before. Neolithic cave sites corroborate this idea of early human transformation of oak woodland into a managed dehesa style system. This management style, which at the time included these oaks that dotted the savanna that looks much like today, also probably included other things like chestnuts and olives and even grapes. So I love that you started with my excellent deduction about fire beavers. And I mean, that's gonna that's here to stay. I think we've proven that time and time again. Yeah, I think what we need to do is figure out what like what is the sound that beavers make? Because I think we need to have like a chorus of them singing like I thought they communicate by slapping their tails. Is it? Do they not make noise? I don't think they make noises. I don't know. Oh, that's terrible. A sloshy thump of a tail is attractive. I won't say that, but <laughs> but it, it's no like guttural call that sounds like a choking lizard, which is really what I was hoping for. I don't think so. I mean, they spend a lot of time in the water. You can't hear stuff in the water or like make noise in the water. Fish don't make noise? No. Fuck, I think you're right. No, they don't make noise. They share like electrical impulse signals and stuff and... They excrete stuff. I don't know. The, a, lot of, a lot of excrement. That's how fish talk. <laughs> We've said the word excretion and excrement too many times in this episode. Sorry. This is wrong. Back to the pigs. Back to the pigs. Are they eating... Ch like I've, I know pigs that eat like nuts and stuff and high fats. Like They taste really good. But could you imagine a pig that like gorged on olives? How like tasty and succulent that would be? I mean... I often call myself a olive fat and pig every Christmas, actually, because usually what I do is start cooking, start making my salad, get the can of olives, start one, two, a handful, do the like, put the olives on every finger thing. And then I look down and there's like three left and I'm too embarrassed to put those three on the salad. So I just end up eating the whole can. You were the second person this year to tell me that they eat olives off of their fingers. It's because everyone does it, Elliot. No one wants to admit it, but everyone does it. Yeah, he said his dad used to sit him down in front of the TV and he would never cook him dinner. He would just open a can of olives and like he would just eat olives and watch TV. Like that was like his 
childhood. Made me real sad. I was cooking dinner. All right. Yeah, that that, that makes me feel a lot worse about I, that joke. I was cooking I was cooking dinner for him and he was like, I really appreciate your cooking because it's better than just canned olives, which apparently he still loves. He's never sick of them. So Wow, that that's impressive. You gotta hand it to him. Yeah. He's a tenacious tenacious guy. Good guy. Cool. <laughs> um yeah, so I guess at some point we're going to talk about this episode. We've been sidetracked like a thousand times already. Yeah. Today is like a bad day for ADHD people, I guess. I don't know. Maybe it's where the moon is. Isn't Pluto like getting in alignment with something soon? I feel like I keep seeing that getting posted places. I don't know what that means, but I'm going to blame Pluto because fuck Pluto. Pluto's not even a planet anymore. We kicked it out of our- not even a planet. Like who gets demoted from being a planet? I mean, I think it happens a lot on the outskirts of our galaxy. There's a couple of big bodies out there that could be planets, but they're just, they're too far away. They got irregular orbits and shit, you know? Listen, I'm a science nerd. I know this shit. Yeah, I'm not. So we're, we're out of my, my bubble and I don't like it. Just, just wait till we talk about black holes. Let's talk about (laughs) DeJesus where I can be smart (laughs) and people will think I'm always smart. It's very important to me. That people assume that I know everything about everything, and that's been destroyed. Okay, so what defines a dehesa? Okay, yeah, let's do that. The typical Spanish dehesa has basically two fundamental features. It's got this really low fertility of soil that we've brought up, but more specifically, it's the phosphorus and calcium, which really makes traditional farming basically unsustainable. Another important factor is topography, which is generally like flattish or hilly, but never really like steep. Within this specific environment, the dehesa is really shown to be the only rational and productive use of this type of a landscape. What makes it really like simplistic and beautiful and important for us to talk about is that it doesn't try to maximize the output of any particular product. Instead, the idea is to use basically a strategy of efficiency and diversification, which allows it to take advantage of whatever resources are available at basically the minimum input of energy and materials. That sounds like something we might need in the future and why we're talking about it on this very optimistic podcast. Yeah. And if you're like in California, like 25 years ago, this would be great. Well, at this point, I had a reference to make about Tank Girl because I've seen it like a hundred times and I miss you, Lori Petty. But if you haven't seen the movie Tank Girl and you're looking for an entertaining, not serious, giant waste of time movie to watch, I highly recommend watching it. It's great. So which part is the tank and which part is the girl? Like, does she have legs or is it on like, like, what what are we looking at here? It's a girl that drives a tank. Oh, she drives the tank. Yeah, she drives the tank. That's different than what I was thinking. Yeah. I I thought it was something pretty cool. Like maybe they made a movie off of like. Listen, I know how how your brain works. You remember Sid from Toy Story? Yes, I remember And all the weird things he made? Like that's what I was picturing. Yes, I know how your brain works when you take two words and smash them together. That's that's how you do everything. That's not what this means. I, I guess it okay. should be tank driver, tank driving girl. How about that? I will leave a a strongly worded letter to the producer of the movie. So, anyways, <laughs> <laughs> good lord, they're gonna be like, "What the fuck? What ha- what have we been smoking today?" I don't. It's really strong. I don't know what it is. Yeah. So this dehesa uh, is basically a savanna with that. Savannah-like, we'll call it, because it's actually not a savanna. It has a summer drought instead of summer rainfall, which is what a true savanna has. But it is an open woodland that feels very similar to a savanna. The trees that still exist within this, these few and far between trees have a really fundamental role in its stabilization. They contribute to the direct general production of the dehesa with like acorns and, again, the uh, tree hay or um, collard greens. Pollard greens. Pollard greens. There we I got there. With pollard greens, again, we talked about like fuel wood and cork and things like edible fungi and other stuff. The tree layer itself is basically the most important component of the dehesa system. And because of that, the sustainable management of those trees is basically the most important thing to keep these systems going. And it's not just the adult trees, but also with the, the natural regeneration of the site, bringing in younger new trees. And this is really the most important problem with the dehesa system, since like natural regeneration, because again, we're kind of fighting that natural cycle, is usually absent or basically scarce. So in the dehesa system, humans are the main driver in keeping the system from falling apart. They're that kind of key linchpin that pushes back that brittleness that we talked about. 
yeah, humans are the key component. Unfortunately, we don't do a good job of that natural regeneration in terms of thinking about the new trees that need to replace the old trees, in particular over the last hundred years or so. And that's only one reason that we're starting to let these things fall apart. The other one is the basically complete abandonment of transhumans, as well as- Did you just bring Robocop into this conversation? Transhumans, not transhumanism. Basically, that seasonal pastoral system that we saw in places like the Turkana, where animals were grazed in like a lowlands for part of the year and an uplands in another part of the year. Not only did they stop doing this, but they also- Robo Shepherd, your move, sheep. First off, it would be Robo Ba. You can do better than that. Robo Crop. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, everyone. We got derailed again. I try- He tried his best, though. I did try my best. So it wasn't just this abandoned system that was so important, but the fact that the sheep that did exist on the landscape, even when they weren't being moved and rotated at those same cycles, had been mostly replaced by cattle due to both a shortage of shepherds and an increasing of stocking rates and grazing periods because of things like government policies, which all basically impacted the slow, slow, sad destruction of these systems. The nail in the coffin really is the accelerated disappearance of these big adult oak trees due to what's the so-called seca, which is basically a sudden dying off caused by like fungal disease and promoted by climactic, biologic, and adaphic reasons. Adaphic? That, that's a new word for me. Can we, can we talk about that? Yeah, I, uh, I had to look that one up too when I was reading about it. Basically, what it means is that the soil conditions change so much that it stresses out the tree because it's not made to live in that kind of ecology or environment anymore. And what this points to basically is the same thing we've talked about in the past, this concept of like cascading failures, which stems basically from the removal of livestock from the landscape. So it's like a shock to the system, basically, like system shock. Ultimately, yeah, it becomes a system shock. It's like the butterfly effect, basically, where everything just snowballs because of one small thing that might not seem like a big deal at first. And uh, that's why the most important objective of Dehesa is really that livestock rearing. That doesn't mean they don't do other things. It just means that's because of this reason, super important. These natural pastures as the main source of fodder for livestock are an essential component to these systems. Uh, These natural pastures are usually like annual grasslands. And the perennials, the things we were talking about that were getting pushed back through this process, really play a fundamental role in like valley bottoms and like dense swords created at those valley bottoms, which are maintained by intense and continuous grazing, which, again, is done to keep them from spreading out. Hi, I'm Liz, here with Red, and we're Listen Left. We're really appreciative of Poor Pearl's realistic take on ongoing collapse. They give a reasonable voice to a subject where reasonable voices are hard to find. Listening empowers us to build a world without capitalism, and that's why we've been supporting our comrades Patreon for over a year now. For our project, Listen Left, we found that many leftist texts, from Marxist Leninist to anarchists and beyond, are very hard to find as audiobooks, and certainly not for free. So we decided to make those audiobooks. Find us on Instagram, SoundCloud, or just listenleft.org for a ton of free accessible audiobooks. Okay, the lowlands have the best soil and the most consistent soil moisture, and also host the perennials. And probably need to be managed to prevent, you know, that shrub pressure from creeping in and also from keeping those perennial crops from spreading out too far. Is that right? Yeah. These perennials try to creep into the rest of the pasture, which they are grazable, but they're not as good for grazing. And there's a bunch of other reasons why they keep them out of the pasture. And that's why that grazing is so important to keep those annual grasslands in existence. This division of annual grasslands and perennials that exist in these very specific spots not only is good for like grazing livestock, but it actually increases the massive amount of diversity that's in this region. There's up to 140 species in the Dehesa that are listed as rare or of concern internationally. Now, for context, these species represent like 34% of the terrestrial vertebrates and 69% of the mammals listed in the conservation directives for Spain. Overall, the Hases have higher species richness than neighboring oak forests. The Hases harbor several globally threatened species that depend on landscape diversity because they simultaneously exploit these different habitats that exist all around this one unique spot. 
Okay, so that reminds me of the frogs and the dragonflies and all the different species that we talked about in the Satayama landscapes. Those edge spaces, time and time again, have proved that they're very important for that diversity in these um, biomes. That's why we love to edge. Go on. <laughs> get off the I know inter- that get one off, means something. Get off the internet and get back to the podcast. So needless to say, these systems are incredibly important to understand, especially in an age of like climate change, where things like weather patterns will demand more similar systems like this as water scarcity becomes more prominent. There's even evidence for the Spanish de Jesus showing like four plus year droughts where these systems were in place and still fed people. Oh, is that, is that grandma? Okay, we can stop recording. Grandma and her peanut brittleness that we brought talked about. Wow. You remember that? Throwback. Throwback. Remember the times? Good times. Good times were had by all. We had talked about the idea of brittleness when we did our civil pasture one, two, and multi-species grazing episode. We talked primarily about the idea that nutrient cycling from the livestock are super imperative to these systems surviving. Yeah, yeah. And what goes in must come out. And these animals stopped outing or shitting, and the soil composition changed because of it sending a cascade of changes through the system, showing its brittleness. And that's that shock, that daphic shock that we talked about. That shock that Elliot was listening to me. So proud. Shocker. Shocker. That's another one that's an internet term. Means something different. Look at me. I'm hip. That one's been around since before the internet, bud. So let's take a look at these oaks in particular. Now, because of the dryness of this landscape, they're planted or selectively cleared extremely far apart and are very intensively pruned, specifically depending on whether it's for cork or acorn production. These trees not only produce nuts, but also help with evapotranspiration, which is the moisture leaving the plants, and help improve the bulk density of the soils around them, creating higher organic matter in the soil itself in an, again, low nutrient soil environment. Sure, and I'll add my two cents by saying they create biomass through all the fallen leaves and branches, which also keeps the landscape pretty fertile. Exactly. So they're able to draw those nutrients from super deep in the soil while also helping with water retention and uh, lowering the temperatures in the grasslands and allowing that C4 grass to continue to photosynthesize even at very hot temperatures. Now, this doesn't mean that like these trees make all these impacts like literally overnight. The research is still really out on how long it takes for these long-term impacts to play out. There's even evidence that it could take decades or more to see the full effects of this system. Yeah, decades we probably don't have, so... Now you're starting to sound like me. I'm Landy. Elf plus Andy, you smash them together and you get Landy. It's easy being you. I like to call you an andy Yeah, that works. That actually works. I'll take it. All right, you andy Now that we've talked a little bit about the trees and some of the animals... We tend to imagine this being kind of the only function of the system, and it's a bit more complex than that. So first, one thing we haven't talked about is this idea of mass years, and that's the years with major acorn drop, which are not annual. And obviously, if acorns are only dropped once a year and that drop is not consistent, that means you have to have a system that's pretty flexible. Now, much of the tree management is around the idea of both maximizing acorn drop and reducing the difference between mast and non-mast years, which is difficult at best and impossible at worst. This means the pigs are given a lot of land for foraging to keep them from like rooting heavily, which can destroy your trees pretty quickly. And that means like up to five acres per pig, which is like a lot of land in order to uh, keep them fed off the landscape while also not destroying the most valuable thing, those trees. Yeah, so did they just nail calendars to the trees and told them to keep up, or did they like sync them up by Bluetooth? How the hell did they do that? So there's been a bit of research, and our guest actually in the next episode is one of the folks involved with it, testing some of these traditional practices to increase acorn production. And while there is evidence that it can be done, it's not necessarily the way people have done it in the past. Okay, But I guess before we start tossing aside all these methods that we're not sure if they work or not, it might be worth keeping in mind that these people also spent, what, dozens of generations perfecting their system. So it might be something that works in perfect conditions, and it might not be the conditions that we have available today. You're saying right now is not the perfect conditions on the earth? Things aren't perfect? I was told they were perfect. I Yes. So, yeah, okay, fine. 
Yes. They're not perfect. This is news to me. We should probably start preparing for that. Everything is perfect. We should start preparing for when things might not be perfect. So yeah, while these systems provide food, the pasture space also supports wildlife, which not only provides like hunting opportunities for communities, but also supports endangered animals, which I guess is important. Okay, so back to transhumans. Classic transhumans. And like we said, despite it being a quote unquote brittle system, it is incredibly resilient because of the stewardship of the landscape. Its real fragility comes from the powers of things like capitalism to influence its management practices. Yeah, it's a tale as old as time. Like a giant fossilized turd falling on a Fabergé egg, capitalism provides. It's got bits of gold in it. No, that's just corn. Sorry, I almost got excited. Elliot was ready to buy himself a nice little dehesa. So unsurprisingly, the traditional dehesa livestock were indigenous breeds, primarily like the sheep and the pigs, with that low stocking density that we talked about and some extensive tillage alternating with 3 to 20 years of fallow period to prevent things like shrub invasion and to supply some fodder, where they would grow like cereals and things like that. And they provided a bunch of other marginal uses. I have a dumb, like, non-farmer question, but is tillage common in pasture spaces? So while we do think of tillage being like your veg crop, it is still something common in like oat fields and things like that. And oftentimes there'll be like pastures that'll be given rest or they might decide that they'll rotate their annual crops through pasture and then let them kind of rewild, whatever you want to, whatever term you want to use. Now, given the sun exposure of the dehesa, because they have so few trees, there really is plenty of room outside the canopy to grow annual crops, even if it is just for like a short period of time. Now, speaking of that tree density and spacing, the ideal density of the oaks in this type of space is between like 8 and 20 adult trees per acre. Now, if you're having a hard time visualizing that, imagine like an American football field and put like 10 to 12 trees on it. That's it. Like it's not a lot. Okay, so you'd think with so few trees and allowing for that much grassland space around each tree, wouldn't that reduce the productivity, especially with acorns from oak trees? So the productivity of acorns is actually like up to 10 times higher in a managed dehesa compared to like a dense Mediterranean oak forest. Studies have actually shown that the mean acorn yield in one of these systems is between like 300 and 800 pounds an acre. That's a lot of acorn pancakes, buddy. Yeah, you better have a big freezer. Now, on top of those acorns, there's that production of grass. And in that same space, these systems, even just in the fall for the fall hay harvest, will produce like 400 pounds an acre. We might have to make an episode and do some acorn pancakes and Iberian bacon. Except I don't think they had maple syrup. So we might have to come up with like, I don't know, can we substitute something for that? Yeah, I mean, I think you could probably do like port, right? I think that port cakes sound great. Very regional, very regional. Yes. I was thinking like- The terroir. terroir. Why can't I say that word? Terroir? Terroir. No, why? Now I'm overthinking it. I don't even know what word you're trying to say. The thing they use for wines. T-E-R-R-O-I-R. I don't know why I can't say it though. I'm an idiot. I don't speak French. Back to the acorn pancakes. Okay. Pancake. Ready? Because I I have an idea. It would probably be pretty good. Bring it. Honey and lemon- And you like reduce it down to like a syrup and put that on there. That'd be pretty good. Honey and lemon juice. Maybe. That's a lot of honey. Yeah. What's wrong with that? I mean, it's a lot of bees. That's a lot of bees. Bee milk. Can we rebrand honey as bee milk? If they can make milk out of almonds and oatmeal, we can can milk a bee. Can milk a bee. Yeah. Milk bees. Oh, oh. The bee farmer's going out to milk the bees today. Ugh, a terrible idea. What is what is with this what is with this weed? So all this is geared around the livestock, basically. Livestock grazing can affect things like soil fertility, both directly through the dung and the trampling down of all the grasses, and indirectly through like the removal of plant biomass and the other disturbances in the system, like burning, which also encourages fast growing species with higher nitrogen content and greater palatability to move in. This in turn generates a more easily degradable litter. You know, if you think about it, annuals break down faster than perennials. So you're able to cycle that energy faster. On the contrary, extensive grazing abandonment, which is what's taken over the last hundred years or so, 
has been associated with the reduction in soil fertility-related variables like organic matter and total nitrogen and the availability of phosphorus. Okay, so I feel like I sort of get all of this as a big picture, but I don't understand the process that's happening here in terms of like how the minerals and nutrients are being like lost or like leached, leached off. So what's basically happening is the animals accelerate the breakdown of the minerals in the plants. I think that part's pretty obvious. Like, you know, if there's a giant stalk of grass and you don't chop it down and it dies and it's standing up and you look at it next spring and there's been no water or anything else to break it down, it's still going to be just standing there. Whereas if a sheep comes through and eats it, it turns into poop like the next day. Now, while this part is obvious, what else really is happening? This process creates that organic matter, that poop. And that's what makes the difference between like dirt, which is just the mineral composition and soil. And ultimately, that also drives things like the reduction in both leaching from runoff and pH balancing, because it's able to help things with like holding moisture and holding stuff from being able to get run off. I had mentioned pH balancing. Now, low pH soils are usually low in organic matter because high soil organic matter usually helps increase soil's natural buffer capacity, which basically means that low pH dirt is separated through neutral pH organic matter. So like, think about like if you put a drop of bleach in a gallon of water, like you go from the super concentrated thing that's damaging to something that like has some use and function. You've basically neutralized it by having one drop in a big thing of water. That's what we're doing with organic matter. This is particularly important because where we're forcing a faster turnaround of these nutrients because they're being consumed and returned to the earth, this unlocks minerals that are unavailable to plants that are in that lower pH, which is what would happen if that organic matter isn't being deposited. And there's more. Okay, so I've asked the question and I'm pretty sure you've started talking about sheep shit again. Yeah, as much as I'd love to continue talking about specifically sheep shit, get those ground raisins. Not specifically. So the few published studies on the effect of grazing abandonment on things like soil microbial activity actually suggest a reduction in the enzyme activity and metabolic efficiency of those microorganisms. So what that basically means is they struggle in poorer soils and aren't able to break things down as quickly, even if that material is available. Okay, so that's the part of the shock to the system then is when there's not enough organic material, aka poo the microorganisms suffer from that because they don't have the resources they need to keep their numbers up. So things start to change and it sort of shocks the entire, like it cascades through the system. Exactly. This reduced ecosystem functioning as a consequence of grazing abandonment can in turn lead to a reduction in organic matter processing efficiency, which is what we're talking about, and ultimately can not affect just the microorganisms but even like carbon storage capacity, which is obviously important given the climate. Right. So this sort of shock came in when they they tried to switch from sheep to cattle or beef, right? That was a part of it. Part of it was the suburbanization that you had mentioned. Okay. Or uh, brought up with Walmart, as well as people abandoning traditional practices of grazing and not letting the land rest long enough. So there's a number of different reasons, but taking animals off of the landscape has been one of the more important ones, at least in the traditional management cycle of grazing, letting it rest, grazing, letting it rest, as opposed to like just having a bunch of animals and trucking in feed. So if they kept eating lamp chops, they would have mitigated climate change maybe. And I guess that's pretty cool, but wouldn't it be easier if we could just eat carbon? Did you just say lamp chops? Hey there, it's me, Crazy Norm, down at Normal Norm's Nut Emporium on John Brown Drive. We're going nuts for nuts in Nutty November. We've got big nuts, small nuts, chestnuts, ground nuts, nut butter, buttery nuts, nut milk, milky nuts, nut cream, creamy nuts, and the for the late night crowd, chocolate covered CBD, deep fried nuts. Want to join the nut extravaganza? Nut up and join the nut posse. Join other members and get your sack of nuts pounded for free whenever you come in and make the creamiest nut milk you've ever had in your own kitchen. Crazy Norm's Nut Emporium, 420 John Brown Drive or online at fortproles.com. So we should talk about the history of this system. I'm already afraid to ask, but is this going to make me angry with how far back in time you want to go? Probably. I mean, what do I say that doesn't make you angry? 
So it was during the first millennium AD that we really see an extensive period of divisions that comprised of like new kingdoms and military and government appointments and all of that clusterfuck stuff that just like caused chaos for like a thousand years. Now, because of how shitty the soil was in this Dehesa, people kind of fought around it and claimed it like as on the periphery, the way like New England claims like Maine because it's got nowhere else to be. And then the military's never really bothered to like do anything or change the way people lived or, you know, they, they basically left the local communities like fragmented. Now, nearly a thousand years of kingdoms coming and going and basically nobody cares about them. Other lands around the Dehesa were more fertile and the populations in those areas were still pretty low. So there really wasn't a lot of reason for people to like need to move to these areas. And that didn't really change until about the second half of the 13th century when like the monarchs really pushed to settle in these areas with concessions of like large properties to nobility and the creation of things like new municipalities, which received their own land holdings to use, manage and basically exploit. Here comes the church, always having ours and our children's best interests at heart. Always, always have our children's best interests at heart. If there's anything I've learned in my life, it's that leaving children with religious leaders will only lead to good things. So now <laughs> I got nothing out of you for that. I thought I would have gotten a laugh. I thought I was being respectful with a moment of silence. <laughs> oh, now one of the largest industries that was based in the Dehesa was- Bacon. Actually, no, it was wool production from the Merino sheep, which are about 800 years old. I didn't know sheep could live that long. The breed. I knew that. Listen, no one mistakes me for the smart one. So what's so special about Merino sheep is their wool isn't scratchy like other wools. So the Spanish went to really great lengths to basically keep the sheep from like ever leaving the region. It was essentially like Rapunzel, but Bapunzel, Bapunzel. God damn it, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> so this uh, this basically pushed this growing textile industry that was based around these sheep to force like political and economic alliances that brought like a lot of really rich people like nobility and military and local governments together to fuck over everyone else. The wool growers basically became a guild known as the Mesta, whose tax payments to the crown earned them a lot of support and gave them a lot of leeway to do a lot of shit. Now, nearly like 600 years later, by the mid-19th century, the Mesta had dissolved and private landowners, including gentry and churches and municipalities, were basically trying to capture all of this grazing land. So despite the vast changes leading up to the late 1700s, the livestock industry continued to flourish in the Iberian Peninsula. Basically, someone made a deal with the devil for the perfect wool. It's soft and warm and all of the nice things about wool with none of the itchy negative things about poorly spun, awful wool. It wasn't my wool is what you're saying. That's what I hear. Yeah, not your wool. Yeah, you have horrible wool. It's itchy. I'd rather have a shirt made out of your beard. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, it is a nice beard. I, I know. I, I don't compliment myself very often, but this is a soft beard. I condition it very heavily. It's glorious. But either way, the whole merino wool thing changed the course of history for the entire region. Yeah, kind of like Shrek. What's with you in the kids' movies? No, Shrek the Sheep. You don't know Shrek the Sheep? No? So like 20 years ago, they found this merino sheep that had gone missing for like six years, and he hadn't shed like any of his wool. So he just basically looked like a fucking like tardigrade with like little stick legs coming out of the bottom. I did see that picture on the corner of the internet one year. He Like, they only caught him, basically, because he had, like, too much wool. He wasn't, like... Because he couldn't see. Well, he couldn't, like, run anymore, because he had just too much wool, so he was just chilling, like, somebody give me a haircut. He was literally just, like, a, a potato sitting out in a field. So he ended up getting, like, live sheared. Like, they broadcast him getting a haircut across the entire country of New Zealand. They basically, like, made a, a holiday out of this stupid sheep that they found. They're like, this is great. We found this sheep. Look at how much hair it has. Did they sell admission, dude? That's awesome. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what there is to do in New Zealand, but... Probably more than that, I would hope. Sheep shearing is, like, tops, I guess. Is that a thing there, tops? T tippy top. Tops. Oh, maybe. I don't know. Sheep are crazy. That's why I love them. Okay, so... This reminds me of our thing, if you're listening, and you haven't tuned into our live streams on Twitch, we have been doing a lot of cool stuff that we do live stream, and there we do like basic how-tos and some other fun stuff. 
So if you're into Twitch, go ahead and drop us a follow and or subscribe, and we can learn some more shit with us here at the Knack. Everything worth doing is worth overdoing, so go spend some more time listening to a couple of, uh, you know, niche micro-celebrities. <laughs> Did you just call us niche micro-celebrities? I mean, I guess. It's not like someone's going to anoint us with, like, a Facebook badge, so I'm going to give myself a badge. No, we don't need no stinking badges. Yeah, no, we don't. Sorry for my shameless plug. No. I guess it... I can't I can't be sorry if it's shameless, so fuck you, go follow us on Twitch. <laughs> it is very valid. We're doing cool stuff over on Twitch, uh, where you get to listen to mostly other people speak instead of me, so if you are tired of my voice, Twitch is a great place to hear someone not me speaking, but it be under the Poor Pearls Almanac. So there's that. Go listen to other people talk. Go visit Twitch. Thanks in advance. So anyways, to get back to what we've been trying to talk about for way too long now, that's been basically the structure for the past thousand years of the dehesa and kind of how it evolved is it's all really based on this like perfect wool. But like we said, the region was fairly unstable in terms of leadership between the military and the churches and all the other colonizers. The historical roots of the Dehesa that we see today really derive from the time of Christian repopulation. Now, what's particularly interesting is that despite these constant changes, the land management practices themselves stayed fairly consistent despite the overwhelming percentage of sheep versus like other livestock during this Merino boom. I guess that kind of figures though, like if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Or if it's brittle, don't touch it. Brittle, brittle, baby. Bum, 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 bum. The point is, if it's brittle, we need to touch it, like, say, a Polaroid picture. Shake it. Shake it like a Polaroid picture. I just got a mental image of Andy chasing sheep and shaking acorn trees and him screaming, I'm farming. <laughs> Technically, it's farming. Also, is shaking acorn trees a euphemism? No, I think you're confusing that with dropping nuts. Hey, it's Norm's Norm. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good, dude. <laughs> I love it. So let's dive in a little deeper, and we're going to look at the last few hundred years specifically, between like the mid-13th century and the mid-18th century. That's not the last few hundred years. Yeah, we're getting there. This was a time of great change and consolidation. There's one particular book, The Book of Hunting by Alfonso XI, which documents the Christian colonization of southwestern Spain, as well as the accompanying shift from those hardwood forests and expanding that dehesa system to those areas. So we've known these dehesas have existed for thousands of years, just not necessarily where or when they existed compared to where they are today. Basically. Now, the exact process by which these uh, landscapes emerged during this consolidation period really is still unclear. But this is why understanding the politics of the time is really important to understanding the landscape management practice. Things like resettlement charters, describe land use practices that could have resulted in the creation of these dehesa systems. Think uh, Things like cutting timber for use as farm implements or building materials or uh, stripping cork for beehives and the cultivation of crops and all of these different things are documented. Extensive grazing and acorn gathering, for example, appear to be the most important and widespread land use practice during this period on both the communal and the privately owned lands. So the development of the dehesa was partly an extractive thing. They basically saw these forested areas and thought if the land can still produce food with less trees and stuff around, that it wouldn't be a bad thing to take all of these materials out and just change the entire forest to a dehesa itself. Yeah, it was a chance to harvest materials while still theoretically having a sustainable plan afterwards. Whether or not that was entirely true, I think that was kind of the vision. By the 15th century or so, when we start to have a little bit more information to work from, the extensive dehesa systems that we see today was pretty much already fully formed. These were usually settled just outside the populated areas, usually on the margins between like municipalities and more of the traditional high-intensive productive farmlands. And it's basically like, again, where those noblemen and uh, military leaders and all those areas had owned essentially open stands of oak. Now, over time, the towns and farmlands began to encroach on the woodlands that did exist while seasonal grazing expanded the dehesa along its outer edges. So you essentially have like everyone slowly digging into these woodlands. And part of this grazing expansion was because of the incredibly powerful Mesta, 
those Merino sheep owners that existed at the time, which drove most of the wealth of the region. So if they wanted something, they got it. So basically what we see here are two categories that all of the Dehesa land falls under. Privately, Dehesa owned by the nobility and clergy and the agrarian oligarchy and the public Dehesa, which is controlled by like municipalities or communities. These public lands are managed by administrators or in some areas by associations of multiple administrators who shared in the ownership of a single property and divided the revenue from its uses. That sounds like a cooperative. Yeah, pretty much. So for a public dehesa, the governing boards from each municipality assumed the authority to manage the use of their communally held properties. And this practice is still pretty common today. On public lands, grazing and browsing of livestock was the most important commercial use because, obviously, especially on the fresh pastures during the fall and the winter. So typically, the grazing rights were usually leased to members of the Mesta, an arrangement that guaranteed the seasonal presence of merino sheep. The second most important use for the lands was the acorn foraging by the domestic pigs. Okay, here we go. Bacon time. Bacon time. So the pig foraging permits were leased at what was considered an appraised rate on the public lands. The livestock use permits were leased at lower rates for summer pastures or any additional agricultural byproducts, including forage and hunting for small game on fallow fields and things like post-harvest stubble, which remained free for use by the local residents. We didn't really get to talk about bacon there. I'm disappointed. But the high value benefits from the public lands were shared equally while the marginal benefits were shared as needed. I feel like this probably reduced the risk of people trying to take advantage of the commons for themselves and being greedy. Yeah, I'd imagine that's probably why they operated this way. Now, the third most important commercial activity on the Dehesa was crop cultivation. Well, again, talked about this a little bit before. People don't traditionally think of crops when they think of like the Spanish dehesa, but it's not like they only lived on like the fat of pigs. So the predominant crop was cereal for human consumption grown in like biennial or triennial rotation systems with like intervening fallow years. Traditionally on these public spaces, this was like something you could do free of charge. Now the forestry uses on these sites had only like minor commercial value, which I think makes sense when you think about how few trees there were, but it was really important for that land management. Tree pruning was thought to increase the production of acorns, and like we said, there's some dispute on this, but even still, things like firewood and charcoal were able to come from the cut branches at basically no cost. So again, it's all collectively owned and managed, with the exception of the most profitable business, which is the permitting for the merino sheep grazing. Exactly. Now, I know we'd said we weren't going to talk about it, and we're, we're not. I'm just bringing this back up, that the other major crop for the Dehesa is cork, although there's really almost no information about how this was traditionally managed. This is the same pretty much for like all the other Dehesa uses, things like hunting and fishing and stoneworking and beekeeping and the harvesting of mushrooms and other plants and truffles and all that good stuff. We know it existed. We know people did it. We have lots of documentation that these were used, but the practices, their extent, the management, all of that's pretty much been lost. So now while there was this long period where things changed slightly from like 6,000 years ago to like 18th century, there's what's considered to be like a second evolution of the Dehesa starting in the late 18th century to the mid 20th century. A bunch of events took place in the early 19th century, which we just don't have time to go over. But if you would like a deep dive on that history of the Merino sheep, I was on another podcast, Cocktails and Capitalism, talking about it a few weeks back. Actually, at the release of this a few months back, I'd recommend going over there to hear about it because it is an interesting story. If you enjoy listening to me ramble, enjoy listening to me drunk ramble. So ultimately, thousands of municipal and communal estates throughout southwestern Spain once managed as public lands became like privately owned properties. The reforms of the 19th century resulted in an almost total disappearance of this public land in the south and west of Spain. During like the 20th century, fossil fuels were used to restore any sense of like agrarian power of this region, which obviously led to worse ecological degradation. And that basically brings us up to today. Amazing. So... It took them that long to perfect Iberico ham. Yeah, they don't call it a 
Oh, shit. I wish I had something. I thought I had something for that. I, I just want one. I'm willing to spend almost $2,000 on a ham because apparently it's that good. I got to try it. Is it that expensive? Yeah, it's like 1800 bucks. Well, that's for a whole one. You you don't have to get a whole one. You can get like pieces or something. I mean, we have a lot of oak trees. We could just collect acorns. We could have one, Elliot, together. We could have a an Iberian ham baby. I'm so into this ham, I almost bought, it's like a $300 like stand for carving your ham. Like It's got to be held a certain way at a certain angle to get like the primo cut. Ham stands. Ha- I can do a ham stand. You could do a ham stand? Let's make an No, Iber- I can't do a ham stand. No, let's do an Iberico. Let's make an Iberico ham stand. That's like some weird like 90s cheerleader thing. It's like, let's do the, the Iberico ha- ham stand. It's a band move in cheerleading competitions. Yeah. The Iberico ham stand. Crowds are just whipping acorns. <laughs> what could go wrong? What are we talking about? Let's end this episode. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so the point being is that what traditionally existed in places like the Dehesa system, the, that region, is going to be a more prominent landscape feature. So I think it's particularly interesting for us to understand how these systems work and what it took to make them work. And unfortunately, a lot of that knowledge has been not necessarily lost, but it's been isolated, we'll say. It wasn't written down. Much of it wasn't written down. And because of the type of system it was, there wasn't a sense of repetition the way we think of like the other systems we've talked about where you would do it every few years or you would see that uh, Swidden system you know, move across a landscape and you would be exposed to it repeatedly. These systems, like we were talking about the regeneration of the trees, that doesn't exist because oak trees live for hundreds of years. So it was very ancestral to understand these things, as opposed to more of the hands-on practical piece of it. So it's an important thing to think about, especially here in the US, where the West Coast is probably going to look more and more like this in the future. It's also important, in my mind at least, to understand the political leanings that can lead to how the system is managed and utilized. Because when we talk about like, or at least when I think about when we're talking about this stuff and we're saying, hey, this is what somebody did and this is why they did it. The idea isn't that we're going to go back and do it exactly like them, but to look at why they did it and to understand that those events cast shadows on what your options are in the future. So the events that are happening in like California are going to cast very unique shadows of what can exist there in the future. If we understand this framework, we can at least start to see how maybe that might help us fit into that, again, for the metaphor, shadow that exists in California already. Does that sound like it makes sense or do I sound like a drunken rambling idiot? Both. Nailed it. (laughs) It makes sense and you also sound drunk, sir. I wish. I am not that lucky. I just want to go watch Tank Girl. Now that I mentioned it, like I just, I've been thinking about that movie this whole episode. I just want to watch it again. I'm going to remake Tank Girl. We should do it with a giant pig and talking sheep instead of talking kangaroos. And I'll see Why didn't you tell me they were talking kangaroos until now? You never asked. How is that something somebody should ask? Like, is that something that should be like a standard form? Like, hi, how are you? Are there kangaroos in your recent movie? Andy, it gets better. Ice T is one of them. (laughs) I shit you not. Have you ever seen Black Sheep and not the one with Chris Farley? No. Oh my God. I think it's Australian, but for everyone that loves sheep and loves like horror comedy movies, that is a A plus. It's about like a, a sheep that's evil and smart and it's just amazing. It makes me love my sheep so much more every day. I just hope they someday bludgeon me to death with like a meat cleaver. You've seen that in Not Tank Girl. Yes, I have. This concerns me, Andy. This is how we end this episode. Go watch Black Sheep and Tank Girl and then we, we're going to do a vote on Instagram in like a month when I've forgotten that we've had this conversation. Yep. And someone's going to remind me because I'm telling you right now that I'm going to forget. So that way someone reminds me. I think it's going to be a tie. And then we're going to see who watched what and which one's better. Well, now I have to watch Black Sheep. You do have to watch Black Sheep. You have to watch Tank Girl. Uh, Fine. We will have a cross movie marathon. That sounds awesome. Let's do that. All right. We're done. This is Andy. This is Elliot. This is the Poor Pearls Almanac. And we are sorry for all of this. Sorry for everything. <laughs>